Hey folks, how you doing? This is Wayne S. Pierce for the American Liberty Radio Network. Yes, I've got coffee. What, you know, what about it, man? What about it? I like my coffee. All right. This is the 30th of This is the 30th of March 2017. Lots of things going on. There is a lot, a ton of just, I'm, I cannot even begin to tell you. <laughs> just cannot even begin to tell you, folks. I can't. I mean, things, I mean, from yesterday's uh, podcast to today, I've seen uh, so many headlines, so many things, read a couple of stories, not a couple, but I read a few stories and I literally... I'm 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 I, I am so you know uh, flabbergasted or gabberflasted or however you want to pronounce it I don't know I'm trying to be funny here because the the crap that I'm seeing is completely insane okay and um I just, I, I, I don't know where to begin, folks. I honestly don't know where to begin. So let me begin here. Let me just start right here, okay? We live in a country that is based upon our concepts of peace, freedom, liberty, and security. If at some point that is upset in any way, shape, or form by any internal or external forces, we the people can come together and stand together and do what we must do. Okay. And um, that's just the way it is. And we have an enemy out there. We have an enemy. And that enemy literally is choking the life out of us, okay? Literally choking the life out of us in terms of trying to get rid of our First Amendment, trying to get rid of our Second Amendment, trying to get rid of all conservative talk radio, trying to get rid of all, shut down anybody that disagrees with the current, you know, uh, globalist system and all this, right? Well, let me point my finger right where it deserves to be pointed. Jerome Corsi is not the problem. He writes... Google and Soros behind fake news on internet privacy, another hoax in the war of the First Amendment, funded by Google and George Soros, a group of leftist foundations have organized a fake news war against the GOP, claiming that Republicans have voted to overturn Obama administration FCC rules designed to protect internet privacy. Three entitles, that's what it says, three entitles Google, Soros, Open Societies Institution, and Ford Foundation have contributed more than $72 million, roughly two, uh, since roughly 2006, to nonprofits that have been most active in pushing net neutrality as well as privacy rules on the broadband industry to give the government a firm foothold in regulating the Internet. The grant amounts were gathered from public resources including nonprofit 990 tax forms, the nonprofit's web pages, and other public sources. A 2015 study released by the Media Research Center estimated the Ford Foundation and the Soros Open Society Foundation alone had contributed more than $196 million to pro-net neutrality groups, between 2000 and 2013, funding various efforts launched Netroot Nations, the leftist internet political activist uh, convention originally launched by Daily Cost readers and writers. 
Google's interest in privacy rules for ISPs and broadband providers should be self-evident. The draconian privacy rules only apply to Google's competitors in the broadband industry, leaving Google, arguably, the... Um, <laughs> Let me read that again. It's very, very important. And I want to use this operative word right here. The draconian privacy rules only apply to Google's competitors in the broadband industry, leaving Google, arguably the world's worst violator of online privacy, virtually unscathed. Google, one of the most powerful companies in the world and one that routinely preaches an ethos of openness and transparency, is surprisingly non-transparent when it comes to its own contributions to organizations that support a government takeover of the Internet. While the company has a transparency webpage, it is largely a fig leaf, a token list of nonprofits it supports currently in the past and in the past, offering no details of the often staggering amounts of funding it provides to groups that supports its public policy goals. The truth is, Google and Soros are pushing uh, a complete distortion of the issue in the fake news war launched against the GOP on issues including net neutrality and internet privacy. The truth is, the left wants to control the internet to impose censorship of conservatives while Google has made millions of dollars quietly selling to third parties a massive amount of information Google has harvested by monitoring web browsing and collecting GSP location data, typically without the knowledge or consent of Google users. What truly is involved with the internet privacy issue traces back to at le last our effort of Obama administration getting the Democratic Party-controlled Federal Communications Commission to rule on October 27, uh, 2016, that Internet providers like Verizon, Comcast, Core, and AT&T had to obtain prior authorization from customers to make information mined from the customer's web browsing activity before selling that data to third parties. As Breitbart News revealed, the truth about the party-line House vote on Thursday to overturn this rule was that the Obama administration last October was attempting to move regulation of privacy issues into the domain of the FCC instead of the Federal Trade Commission, where privacy regulation has traditionally resided. Quote, the FCC already has the ability to oversee privacy with broadband providers, uh, unquote. Representative Marsha Blackburn, uh, Republican of Tennessee, explained to Breitbart.com, quote, that is done primarily through Section 222 of the Communications Act, and additional authority is granted through Sections 201 and 202. Now, what they did was to go outside of their bounds and expand that, unquote. Quote, they did a swipe of the jurisdiction of the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, unquote. Quote, they have traditionally been our nation's primary privacy regulator, and they have done a very good job of it, unquote, Blackburn continued. I'm going to put the rest of this, because there's video here as well, on uh, the podcast page, American Liberty Radio Podcast. <sighs> I wanted to bring that up because I saw this yesterday. I saw something similar yesterday as well, but I wanted to bring this up, and I knew, I knew that uh, Infowars was going to refer to it, and uh, they did, of course. Um, several things I want to say. George Soros is an evil man. If you don't believe me, uh, check his history. He basically helped the Nazis take the Jews to the death camps. Coffee, folks. Onward and upward to bigger and bigger things. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. This is today, Clifford Cunningham, Infowars.com. ICE releases second name and shame list of sanctuary cities. Number jumps to 150. The number of jurisdictions that refuse to cooperate with immigration and customs enforcement 
rose to 150, while the number of detainer requests refused dropped significantly, according to agency's weekly name and shame list. Yeah. Here, I'll let you look at this. I'm not even going to read it. I'm going to let you look at it, you examine it. I need to ask you a question because it's very important in this in this environment that we currently live in. The vast amount of uh, American people in the United States want peace, freedom, liberty, and security for the nation. Okay? That, that's, that's bottom line. My question is, why aren't we the people standing up and making sure we get that and we defend that? Okay? I, I, I just, it's a good question, isn't it? I just, I, I, I don't, my thought is, I don't get why people don't stand up and, 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 and defend themselves. I mean, they're doing it here and there, little bits and pieces here and there, but then they don't stay for the long run. They don't stay for the long run. They don't stay at the front line. They don't move and keep moving and keep defending. They continue to look at this and say, well, you know, I got to get back to work. You know, or, or whatever it is. Now get this. <laughs> I saw this a couple of years ago when I was doing some research on, a, on one of my programs. And something came to mind, and this is why I wanted to research it years ago, about three years ago now. And that was, I saw that the county sheriffs, the state police, the highway patrol, all this, they were getting all of this older military equipment, such as the Humvees and such as the, you know, MRAPs and all this. And they were getting military style, you know, equipment. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, doing this research, what the hell is this all about? Well, there was this thing in Sparks, Nevada called Street Vibrations. And one day, one you know, when it was on the one weekend, uh, myself and, and, you know, Diana went down to the, you know, Victorian Square in Sparks. And we're looking at all this. This is a big, huge, they close off the street and it's a big, huge, you know, to do and everything. And we looked at, and we're walking through this area. And I, I looked to my left. I said, hey, look over there. And it was an MRAP with the words sheriff on the side of it. Huh, a little show of intimidation? Uh-huh. But let me tell you why. I, I love my coffee. Sorry about that. Tate Fegley over at Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot org, writes... End the state's monopoly on policing. Consumer-driven private policing is no illogical fantasy. Compared to the general population, advocates of a minimal state and those of a stateless society overwhelmingly agree on a vast majority of political issues. This is what they say. Uh, this is what uh, Tate uh, Fegley uh, uh, over at Mises says. I wish to argue here that there should be at least one more agreement between them than there are traditionally than there traditionally has been. Policing services need not be monopolized by the state and would be more efficiently provided by private sector. Almost every individual who has argued for the desirability of having policing services provided in a free market does not stop there. But Apple but but as he says, applies the same reasoning to other services monopolized by the traditional minimal state and thus conclude that a stateless society is optimal. 
unconvinced um <clears throat> oh here it is i'm highlighting i'm just going through sorry for the silence i'm just you know eyeing through this article it says here uh, an alternative that is seldom considered, however, is one in which private enterprise competes to meet consumer preferences for policing within a state system. Such a framework is immune to criticism of the stability of the stateless society, uh, such as that by Tyler Cowen, who argues that arbitration networks in a stateless society would eventually collude and resemble a state. In this alternative framework, where the state still possesses a monopoly on the legitimized uh, initiation of force within a geographical territory, concerns such as protection agencies enforcing very disparate legal rules are moot. These agencies would only enforce generally recognized property rights, that is, rogue agencies violating property rights, would be opposed by uh, both other agencies and the state. In other words, I'm going to let you, I'm going to stop right there and let you read the rest of this because it goes into a lot of stuff. And because of time constraints, <laughs> I'm, I want you to be the judge of this. You determine how you feel about this article. Myself, personally, I believe that the monopoly on policing in a state is... Uh, Let me rewind that. The state has a monopoly on law enforcement. Um, uh, oh, Jesus, policing. There we go. Um, the state has monopoly over the law enforcement. Okay, that is wrong. That is absolutely, positively, 100% wrong. I believe that we should not have any involvement in the state as far as policing goes now the administration of the state such as you know collecting taxes doing this you know helping out in this area getting you know whatever that is part of the state but to have a police state which is the united states of america but to have each state as a individual police state monopolizing law enforcement under the auspices of state government is totally and absolutely wrong we should have a minimal, non-monopolized system. And should it be private? Should it be, you know, a, a, a private enterprise, not a state-funded uh, um, organization? I, that I don't know. Because you start getting people with big heads and egos and everything else, and then they'll start, you know, it, it would be a freaking nightmare, and it'd go back into the police state thing again. You know what I'm saying? So do we need a private police organization funded by taxpayers, not funded by or controlled by the state? You know, this is something that, this is something I've been hearing about for many, many years. When I, um, uh, Many years ago, when I was uh, in high school, I was hearing stuff like this. I was hearing people, and this is shortly before I graduated, I heard my friends and other people talk about, wow, there's, uh, the, the, the state, the city is getting you know, bad. And, it, and, and these people, these you know, fellow students in my school uh, that I overheard, heard, and even some of my friends were saying that, um, that they are concerned that we would have a police state, that we would have a Nazi-style state on our hands. That's what, this is back in the late 70s, folks. So this, this concept of people recognizing the fact that the state has too much power goes back a long way, a lot longer than I've been alive, I can tell you this much. So... What do we do? <clears throat> Excuse me. What do we do? How do we... How do we end the monopolization of state law enforcement? 
How do we end that? Because you know damn well that whoever we vote into office is, you know, they're not going to do anything about it, even though they say it on the campaign trail. Yeah, when I get in, I'll do this and and, and we'll take that. You know, no, no, no. What it basically is, a politician, a person running for public office, will say whatever he has to say to get in there. And he'll form it in words and all of the... Go look up the phrase neuro-linguistic programming. Neuro-linguistic programming. This is what they use to get you to, hey, you know, I'll pull you in, suck you into what they believe. And then once they're in office, they'll slam the door shut and say, no, don't come talk to me because I got work to do. You know, that kind of thing. So where am I going with all this? Well, let me tell you, the United States of America was formed under the concept of peace, freedom, liberty, and security. I said that before. The people of the United States of America, after the ratification of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights in uh, 15th December 1791, were happy because everything they wanted, pretty much everything, that, you know, kind of compromise here and there, you know, but let's just say everything for now. Everything that people wanted, they got. You know, in a way, you know, they got it. So, so, it was fine and dandy for about 95 years. It was, it was great from 1776 to 1791. That was 15 years. That was They had to work to put all that Constitution and Bill of Rights together. So that's how long it took. It just didn't happen overnight. Okay, I'm just saying. Didn't happen overnight. So from 1791 to 1871... What is that, 90 years? Almost 100 years. This country was doing just fine. Yeah, we had our squirmishes. We had our, uh, you know, little battles here and there. We had, you know, you can just go look. How many wars were there from 1776 when we separated from England How many wars and battles were there in the United States from 1776 to 1891? Or 1871, excuse me. 1871. How many battles and wars and civil wars did we engage in from 1776 to 1871? Okay, so that's your homework. In 1871, President Ulysses S. Grant signed this thing called the Act of 1871. His arms were twisted, figuratively speaking, and literally he was bullied into signing this Act of 1871 for a lot of reasons. But one reason was, <laughs> at that point, uh, six years after the Civil War, we were dead broke, folks. We had absolutely no money in the Treasury. We were broke. Now, the southern side of the United States of America had uh, some money, but it was hidden and all this and anything. So, anywho, the Act of 1871 pretty much handed back the United States of America, to the British. Now, if you don't believe me, uh, connect the dots, follow the money. Your taxes go to, uh, or part of your taxes, I should say, goes to the Queen of England. Go check that out. Okay? So here we are, the United States of America. People came together built this country, got into a bunch of wars, and then a president who was, I would say, not the best one in the world, 
uh, decided, no, nah, we don't want this. We need money. We need to get, you know, back on track here. So he basically handed back the United States to the British. That was President Ulysses S. Grant, the Act of 1871. From that point on till now, 2017, we have had nothing, nothing in this country that we could show as a profit to say we have this. We are not in debt. We are helping others in... No, 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 no. See, the Act of 1871 caused... It was the cause of what is what we're living today. It was the cause of the demise of the economy and the commerce in the United States because we, the people, had to pay for that. Okay? It wasn't the government saying, well, we only got so much money, so we're just going to go here and here, and we're going to do... No, 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 no. It wasn't like your home budget, folks. We were already tremendously in debt up to 1871 because of all the wars and the civil wars and, and all of that. All of the wars, everything. I mean, we were severely broke at that point. Okay? 11 years prior... An Illinois senator was elected president, Abraham Lincoln. He freed the slaves. The, some of the southern sympathizers in the north went, no, 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 that ain't going to work for us. Well, they had no choice. But the failed attempt, the failed attempt for the south to secede was funded by the French if you don't believe me, go back and connect the dots. And some of the other things were happening at that time. Again, six years out from the end of the Civil War and the assassination of President, uh, or seven years uh, out, I think it was, no, six years out from the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. Pretty much, President Ulysses S. Grant gave back the United States of America to, to, the, to the British. The Act of 1871 took the United States of America, the United States of America, and the Bill of Rights of the United States of America, and went, now we'll set that aside. When President Ulysses S. Grant signed the Act of 1871, he basically signed a newer constitution, or a, what I call the, the corporate constitution, basically what we're living under today. Not the organic one prior to 1871, but the newer one, the, 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 the one we're living under today, the corporate constitution. That's what we're living under today. Now, why do I say all of this and how does that, you know, how does that dovetail into today's, you know, today's podcast? Well, again, I've asked the question, what are people doing to defend this nation? Are they getting so far ahead, you know, pushing and defending that they're going, wait a minute, I got to go back to work and take care of my family. Are they doing that and then just, you know, stopping themselves? Are they defending Illinois the way they should be? Or are they defending California the way they should be? Or are they defending New York State the way they should be? Are they doing, are the people doing what they need to do to keep this country in our hands? That's a bigger question there. What are you doing to keep this country in the hands of the people, not the hands of the elites? This is American Liberty Radio Network, American Liberty Radio. Dot com. You know what you want. You want the truth. You want the facts. Without all the BS. American Liberty Radio Network. American Liberty Radio. Dot com.
ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Distorted Reality. I am your host, Nick Tucker, and I welcome you to the broadcast. Distorted Reality with Nick Tucker. DistortedReality.podbean.com and Distorted Reality with Nick Tucker on American Liberty Radio Network. There's a show that's not afraid to ask questions no one else will ask. Not afraid to say what no one else will say. Friday nights at 7 p.m. Listen to Restricted Airspace with Tina Marie. Where no topic is off limits. Conspiracy theories. Paranormal activities. Hoaxes. Unexplained. It's what we talk about. Question everything. Trust no one. Restricted Airspace with Tina Tina Marie. Marie. Friday at 7 p.m. On the KCOR Digital Radio Network out of Las Vegas, Nevada. Hey, folks, how you doing? This is... American Liberty Radio Network, American Liberty Radio on Spreaker.com and American Liberty Radio.com. How are you? Taxpayers paid $162.5 million for union work. Federal workers spend 3.5 million hours doing union business on taxpayer dime. Bill McMorris at freebeacon.com, 28th March 2017. Government employees spent nearly 3.5 million hours conducting union business, costing taxpayers, you and I, $162.5 million in 2014, according to a new report. The Office of Personnel Management... Did not know there was one of those. The Office of Personnel Management revealed that official time increased by more than 10% between 2008 and 2014, the most recent data available. Official time is the practice of allowing a federal worker to remain on the clock even as he conducts business uh, for his labor organization rather than his government job. OPM found that... uh, uh, employee represent, uh, representatives logged 3.4 million hours dur- uh, doing official union activities in 2014, a 20% jump from 2008 fiscal year. OPM concluded that official time cost taxpayers $162.5 million based on average salary and benefits uh, payments made to federal workers a $5 million increase from 2012. I'm <clears throat> going to put that on the American Liberty Radio podcast Facebook page because why do we have unions? Why do we have unions, folks? Well, because everybody wants a good job and everybody wants good pay and everybody wants... <clears throat> Let me tell you something, folks. More and more businesses, the, the, the union memberships have decreased over the last 25 years to the point where there's probably somewhere in the vicinity of about 20 to 30 percent of the American workers in, in labor, such as trucking and construction and all of that. They're the only ones in a labor union. Everybody else is getting paid a pretty decent wage not being in a union, okay? Excuse me. Trump's budget uh, cuts, yeah, because he's going to cut some budgets, folks. Trump's budget cuts face resistance from Republican lawmakers. Funding for the federal government will run out during the last week in April, Republican leaders are voicing disapproval of budget cuts proposed by President Donald Trump. Quote, I doubt there'd be a lot of appetite for dramatic cuts this year, unquote, Senate Majority Whip John Cronin, uh, Republican of Texas, told Roll Call. Uh, Quote, I just uh, look at 
I just look at it as a conversation. They've got their views, we've got ours, and we need to sit down and work that out, unquote. According to CG Roll Call's Budget Tracker newsletter, Republican leaders such as Cornyn are openly disapproving of Trump's requested $18 billion in spending cuts for the current fiscal year budget, Politico reports. I'm going to let you read the rest of that because it does say read more. Um, yeah, uh, let, let me, if you're going to cut something, folks, let's say you're living at home and you're saying, or, you know, you're living at home, like you're living in your mama's basement or something. Um, you're there in your home. You've got your family. You're doing what you're doing to keep your head above water. And you decide we're going to make up a budget and here's what we're going to do. Here's our actual expenditures. Here's our variable expenditures. Here's what we've got to cut. It's not going to cost you any money, folks, to make these cuts. You just don't spend the money on it, right? This is your own personal home budget. Why does it cost our politicians that we put into office money to just not spend anything on that particular department or that particular, you know, uh, organization or policy or whatever? Why is it costing us so much money? Because here's why. And I talked about the Act of 1871, and uh, the United States of America is now the United States of America Incorporated. So it's a business. So here's why it's costing us so much money for them to cut budgets, to not spend money on certain things. It's because it's a gamble, folks. You ever been to Las Vegas or Reno or Atlantic City and you threw your money out on the crap table or, or put a few bucks on the blackjack table? You ever done that? Here's what the government does with your tax dollars. They put it into a fund which says if this policy fails or if we have to cut this budget over here in this department or whatever, they're betting for the loss of the money. They're not betting with you in hopes that you, the taxpayer, can save money. No, 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 no. They're betting for the failure of certain things. They're betting for the budget cut because they make money. Well, let me put it to you simply as this. If you're spending $100 over here, but you're uh, in, on one hand, and on the other hand, you're spending $150 on something else, that's $50 more that's come, or, uh, you know, basically, you've budgeted one thing for $100. For $100, you've budgeted this certain thing that you've budgeted. If you are spending more than that, you're, <laughs> you're in the red. And that extra is what the politicians are betting on. When they lose that extra you know, money in that budget, they're getting a kickback over here in this other department that that money's going to. Robbing Peter to pay Paul, you know, you've heard of that. It's like me walking into a, you know, it's like you handing me money and me handing off a little bit over here to this person because I've cut my budget the way this other person told me to. In other words, I know it's complicated. I know it's, I can't explain it really well, but it's basically the politicians are betting on and for the loss of that extra money in that budget. They make money. They get a kickback, folks. And it's perfectly legal, barely, because now they're able to take that extra money and go put it in various, uh, uh, quote unquote, companies in the New York Stock Exchange and make more money off of that. Why, when you go to uh, Congress and you're making $174,000 a year, why is it by the time you, if you leave in four or eight or 12 years, you're a freaking millionaire? 
Why? They bet on the loss of certain things. They bet on the collapse of certain departments, certain companies. They bet on that loss and for that loss. Has nothing to do with, oh, let's make it better. Has nothing to do with funding it to make it better or to streamline it in any way, shape, or form. I myself personally think we need to just totally abolish welfare, but that's not going to happen. Because they're betting on these people getting on the dole. And the money that the politicians invest in that welfare of those people, in other words, they're forking out all this money, you put those people on SNAP, you put those people on EBTs, you put those people on some sort of health care provider under the state, those politicians are getting a kickback, folks. It's called lobbyists and special interest groups. That's only part of it. But they're making money on the loss. Don't ever Tell me, oh, it's just, it's going to cause people to suffer and the politicians are just, they're doing the best they can. Shut the hell up. They're betting for the loss. Okay? Because when you and I go to Las Vegas or Atlantic City or, you know, uh, Reno, Nevada or Lake Tahoe, we bet in hopes to make money. <laughs> We don't bet on the fact that, oh, my God, I just lost 20 bucks, and so I'm going to get money on a kickback from that. No, we've lost that money. It's gone, folks. The politicians bet on and for that loss and get a kickback. So I don't want to hear it anymore, folks. Your politicians are freaking corrupt. And there's a handful, I would probably say 25, 30 politicians in Washington, D.C. right now, I'm, that's, you know, conservative, maybe too minimal, I don't know, 25 or 30 politicians that are for you and I, that are for, that want to step up and, and do what has to be done to help us. But they're, they're getting their ass kicked by these corrupt politicians, and they're not making our lives any easier. So there you go. Anywho. I ran it on that way too long. <laughs> but I wanted to get that out there and let you know what's going on. Okay? I wanted you to know exactly where it was coming from. Okay? And, and how it all works. In, in, just in that regard as far as budget cuts are concerned. Trump bump. Consumer confidence hits, hits 16-year high. House prices rise. U.S. property tax, excuse me, U.S. property taxes hit record in 2016. The prior national record of property taxes was set in fiscal year 2009. It is for $540 billion dollars folks, property taxes. By the way, your property taxes, I was talking to you, you know, I was just mentioning the fact that these politicians are getting kickbacks. Let me tell you what property taxes are, folks. If you haven't realized this yet, you're paying rent on your property every year by paying your property tax. Why is property being taxed? We don't need that. Oh, it's for the schools. It's for the roads. It's for the, no, it's no, <laughs> no, folks, no. You number crunchers out there, Take the average amount of property tax in a, I'm going to say, in, a, in a, an area where, in a city where there's about 300,000 people. You tell me how much of that property tax goes to the schools, goes to the, you know, highway patrol, goes to the county, you know, whatever. Tell me how much of that goes to those people, and then tell me how much of that goes to the state. If I'm not, and I may not be correct on this, but I believe that about, oh, I would say somewhere about 20 to 30% of that property tax that you have to give up every year, about 20 or 30% of that goes to where it needs to go 
or where they say it's going to go. And the rest of it is pocketed by the politicians. I could be wrong on that. <clears throat> and here's something that I wanted to talk about. We have a very, uh, uh, I, I would say, interesting um we have a very in interesting way of starting businesses around the United States of America. And unfortunately, within three to five years after you start your business, you're freaking bankrupt. Why? Overregulation. Period. End of sentence. Done. Overregulation. Overregulation. Learn how big government kills small businesses. Job-killing regulations and taxes must be rolled back. No, they must be completely eliminated. Small businesses are the most vital part of a strong economy, but they are under attack from government regulations, taxes, and other regulations. Trump rolls back job-killing regulations. Good. That's on American Liberty Radio Podcast on Facebook, so check that out. Now, remember 2008, 2009, the housing, what, what is called the housing bubble? <laughs> remember that? Ah, yeah, Jonathan Newman, Mises.org. Housing bubble replaced by student and auto loan bubbles. Six graphs reveal big problems for student and auto loans. The New York Fed's most recent household debt report showed ballooning debt and delinquency in student and auto loans. Total household debt has just about reached its previous late 2008 high of over 12.5 trillion dollars yes folks trillion with a t you'll notice and there's graphs here matter of fact let me just uh there's graphs i don't want to even go into it because you have to see this folks i myself have a question for all you people out there why why are you getting student loans let me tell you what a student loan is folks that's the key to perpetual debt. Well, I you know, some people will say I've paid off my student loan. Yay! Good for you. That was when the interest rates were low, and that was when you probably had a pretty good, you know, you know, job or a career or something where you can pay it off. Did you know that most defaults? on student loans are from doctors and lawyers and did you know that well not most of them I, I shouldn't say that it's about equal between you going to college or university and and somebody going to pre-med or pre-law student loans are nothing more than a key to continual and perpetual uh, indentured servitude okay period all student all student loans every bit of of that on every level should be abolished. Well, how are people going to get through college? How are it's called go find a part-time job. It's called go work your ass off. And it's not that you have to take a full load, folks, in the school. Hello, when you go to college, you don't have to sign up for the whole damn thing and go eight to nine hours a day or whatever it is and study your ass off for what? A piece of paper hanging on your wall? Folks, you can go to the freaking library and get the same damn education over the, uh, uh, probably a little bit longer, but you don't get that piece of paper on the wall. What are you looking at? Are you, gonna, are you so egotistical and arrogant to have people come over and look at the wall and go, oh, look, here, I've got a degree in education. Really? How much money did you spend to get that? <laughs> you know? I, I, it's... A degree on the wall is only beneficial to the people that come into your house and look at it. That's pretty much it. Well, some jobs require a, a BA. They require, a, a, you know, a, an a, an M, you know, a PhD. Folks, go look at the numbers. Okay, they don't lie. Look at uh, various areas of numbers. Seriously. Whatever you're going to college for, 
whatever job you want to get, whatever it is. I don't, I don't care if it's a teaching job at your local elementary school. Whatever career you're going to school for to get the education to go get is not going to be there, folks. It's not going to be there. Have you heard this little phrase called outsourcing? Have you heard this little (laughs) phrase called downsizing? The companies in the United States of America, and and in one way I'm glad to see that certain things are happening now to grow medium-sized businesses here and small businesses here in the United States. I'm glad to see that starting to get a foothold again as it did in the 80s and 90s. But the general public understands that whatever you're going to school for, whatever job career you want, is not going to be there, folks. Because we have over-regulated and underfunded in terms of grants and all of that, people who want to start a business. Everything that I see online and every person that I've talked to so far has said, well, how's your business doing? We want to know, you know, and, and this is what I'm hearing. We want to know if you're making money at your business before we loan you any more money. Uh, Folks, that's the stupidest thing I have ever heard in my life. Have you been denied a credit card because you don't have enough revolving credit? Yeah, get my point? It's a big issue, folks. Student loans need to be completely and totally abolished. And if you want to continue with this scam of indentured servitude called student loans, I suggest you take and defend your freedom of education and do what you must to identify the corrupt organizations that are putting out these so-called student loans. Go check this out. William D. Ford Foundation. William D. Ford Foundation. Go check that out. Now, I know a lot of people are going to be pissed off and say, well, you know, I got, I went to school 20 years ago and, and graduated with an, a, 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 a master's degree in this. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that piece of paper on your wall ain't going to get you a job at McDonald's. Eh, possibly, maybe, I don't know. Folks, we need to change the way we look at what we want As far as a United States of America, we have to change our vision of the United States of America and make it of, by, and for the people again. If we continue to vote in these stupid politicians such as Jerry Brown and Maxine Waters out of California, you're going to get stupid crap happening all over again. We need to rethink the goal of the United States of America. Of America. We need to. I don't give one rip about what these leftists, what these Marxists, what these progressives, what these far left liberal loons want. Their arguments are totally baseless and they have no sense of reality when it comes to peace, freedom, security, and liberty for this nation at all. What they want is a completely collapsed nation, third world design, communist political philosophy embedded in the the United States of America. You heard me right, not installed, but embedded into the United States of America. Oh, and these progressive leftists, they have assistance. You didn't know that? It's called China. 
China can walk right in here and take about a third of the United States and say, okay, you've paid us off. They probably own a lot more than what we think, folks. They probably own a lot more than what we think. Okay? I just, I, I just, yeah. Yeah, 6.5 million taxpayers paid $3 billion in Obamacare penalties in 2016. Penalties paid to the IRS nearly doubled since 2014. Hundreds of companies bidding to build that wall on the U.S.-Mexico border. Federal database shows a large amount of companies want to build the wall. Yeah, I wonder who they are. I bet you companies such as... You know, Burger King, McDonald's, that kind of thing. They don't want the wall built. They probably don't. No, I I wouldn't say probably. I know they don't. They don't want the wall built. They want to get free labor. Yeah. (laughs) You don't believe me? Yeah. If the web page would stop flipping out on me. The federal database showed around 200 companies responded to the federal government's two requests for proposals. One for a solid concrete wall and two chain link fences. And another for wall design, according to the Washington Post. The initial deadline for proposals was Wednesday, but Customs and Border Protection extended the deadline to April 4th and and updated the solicitation with eight pages of questions and answers. Among its uh, its specifics published March 17th, the government seeks a border wall between the U.S. and Mexico that's 30 feet tall of, quote, concrete wall structures, unquote, with no maximum width or thickness, quote, physically imposing in height with uh, anti-climb features and aesthetically pleasing color on the north U.S. side. Yeah, folks, there you go. They want to make it look good. The Department of Homeland Security has estimated the 1,000-mile wall would cost $21.6 billion, nearly double what the Trump campaign has cited. Trump's first budget proposal to Congress, a preliminary draft, asked lawmakers for a $2.6 billion down payment for the wall. Congressional Republicans have estimated a more moderate price tag of $12 billion to $15 billion. Apart from the cost of the wall, the geography where the wall will be built has treaty limitations. A 1970 treaty with Mexico requires that anything built near the Rio Grande River not obstruct its flow, and the same treaty rules apply to where the Colorado River flows on the border of Arizona. There are also environmental regulations over what can be built and where, such as sensitive dunes in California that require a floating fence to allow for natural movement of sand. There are also legal challenges. Nearly all of the land along the Texas border is privately owned, and buying it won't be easy, according to the AP. I'm putting this up on the podcast page. I just highlighted some things out of the article. Uh, from RT. Yeah, folks. Wall. Period. Now, build it. But remember, you can build a big-ass wall all you want. You can build it. It's fine. It's fine. They'll dig underneath, okay? <sighs> They'll dig. Well, you know, that's what I'm saying. I'm going to go away now, folks. Yes, it's always fun and great to come talk to you for an hour. So, uh, hey, talk to you guys later. American Liberty Radio. AmericanLibertyRadio.com. AmericanLibertyRadio at USA.com.